Words. Words, spoken or written, have the power to build people up, confine people to where they are, and break people down. And in this session, we explore the power of words. Assalamu alaikum, good afternoon, and welcome to one of, if not the last session of this year's Abu Dhabi International Book Fair 2021, where this year's edition of the show marks the start of the Guest of Honor Germany program at Abu Dhabi International Book Fair, which will culminate in 2022 with its large scale presence. The Abu Dhabi International Book Fair is proud to host Germany as its guest of honour for the 30th edition of the fair in 2021, a powerhouse of publishing since Gutenberg invented his printing press in the 15th century. Germany has been home to some of the world's greatest writers and thinkers, from Kant to Kafka and Goethe to Thomas Mann. This particular session this afternoon supported by the Goethe Institute in cooperation with the Federal Foreign Office and the Frankfurt Book Fair has been part of a number of sessions over the last week as part of this framework. In effect then we're looking at two years of Germany's presence at the Abu Dhabi International Book Fair with instructive and illuminating programming in both 2021 and 2022. And now we turn our focus to this session. For the next hour or so, as I mentioned, we will be exploring the power of words with two renowned poetry artists, one of whom has gone on to transition into a best-selling author, both of whom have captivated international audiences through their powerful spoken words, ignited and fueled by their sheer passion and emotion, taking the audience alongside them on a journey as they weave their storytelling through golden threads that connect the audience in a powerful collective experience. You are in for a treat today. Pierre Jarawan was born to a Lebanese father and a German mother and moved to Germany with his family at the age of three. Inspired by his father's imaginative bedtime stories, he started writing at the age of 13. He's won international prizes as a slam poet and in 2016 was named Literature Star of the Year by the Daily Newspaper. Pierre received a literary scholarship from the city of Munich for The Storyteller, which went on to receive a, a, become a bestseller uh, and a bookseller's favourite in Germany and Netherlands, France and Brazil. Song for the Missing is his second novel. Pierre has also contributed to stage writing and is a passionate freelance photographer. And we look forward to hearing about his transition to author from Slam Poet. Pierre joins today live from Munich. Pierre, a huge and heartfelt welcome. Thank you very much. Excellent, great to see you and I'm looking forward to the upcoming conversation. Dr. Afra Atik, uh, here live in the audience at the International Abu Dhabi Book Fair, is an Emirati award-winning poet the only female Emirati award-winning poet, having recently won the Special Achievement Award at the uh, Abu Dhabi uh, uh, Music and Arts Foundation Creativity Award. She's been a speaker on multiple platforms uh, and has a degree in diplomacy. Afra has performed at the Louvre, uh, Abu Dhabi and Dubai Opera Stage with a passion for learning, education and community service she spends a significant part of her time taking her craft into schools and universities. She spends a significant amount of time with the community through these endeavours. She gives back to her community through mentorships and workshops with United Chapters. Dear Afra, welcome and many thanks for joining the session today. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Excellent. And of course, you, the audience, you play a pivotal role uh, as guests, but also as hosts, as I invite you to ponder over any questions you may have for Pierre or Afra, as you will have the opportunity towards the final part of the session today to ask our speakers some questions. So over the past 14 months, Pierre and Afra, we have been in the, the pandemic 
uh, during this time. Um, and I really just want to understand, first of all, how has it been for, for you, Pierre, if I come to you first? Uh, tell me a bit about the last 14 months and, and that moment when we shifted into the pandemic. Well, for me, it was kind of difficult because in March 2020, uh, in Germany, my, my new book came out and it was March 2nd and I had a beautiful premiere, premiere in Munich and the literature house um, was sold out and it was a very nice evening and we all thought that this was the beginning of something special and um, we had very high expectations uh, for the book and I had a book tour planned with more than 60 events and only two weeks later that all had to be cancelled and of course um, the book didn't receive as much attention as we all hoped for because you know the focus from the press and everything it shifted from from books and culture or to to all news and, and and the pandemic so of course i'm not the only writer that experienced um yeah this kind of story but it was kind of difficult after yeah, four years of work um, on my second book uh, it was kind of yeah uh, sad to see it you know, disappear in, in the in meaningless uh, way, yeah, you know, something where it didn't receive the attention we all hoped for. Thanks, Pierre. I mean, there's so many unique experiences that we've all been through during this pandemic, but so many things that are similar. And Afro, what about yourself? How have the, the past 14 months been for you? Uh, they've been interesting. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, my, my entire uh, career is built around being in spaces with, with audiences and with, uh, you know, with, in schools and, and in the beginning um, it was such an adjustment to kind of feel like, well, we, we can't be, you know, we can't go to the schools and we can't, uh, events were being cancelled left and right, um, but it was a teachable moment, I think. I think I, I learned about um, creating work despite the circumstances and despite uh, what, what else, is going, was, else is going on in the world. And then you have on top of that the anxiety of being in a pandemic and, and staying safe. And, and I feel so blessed um, to, to be you know, from the, the UAE and to, to have been in the UAE um, when the pandemic was going on because it was, um, it was handled quite well and, and, I, and I, uh, you know, every, they made sure that everybody was safe um, and I you know, spent 365 days with my parents and I feel yeah. like that was really the biggest blessing. And there was, I think in the beginning, I thought I'm gonna be home, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna do all of this stuff. And, and I basically did, <laughs> didn't do any of it. So once I got past that, then I started to, uh, to become more productive, but it was, uh, it was difficult. Indeed, and I think it's really shown us about human resilience and how we have pushed forward and how we have yeah. continued and take this moment right here, right now, as an example. Pierre, you're joining us live from Munich. You're connecting, you're bringing your story to us. Afro, you are here on stage with myself. And Pierre, let me paint a picture. We are here at the Abu Dhabi National Exhibition Center. We have, as I look around, so many bookstores. We have so many exhibitions. We have people on. We are continuing and we're trying our best to do that. And Pierre, next year, we hope to see you here in person. And before we journey through our, our conversation, um, and as we come across various topics or themes, Pierre and Afra, feel free to capture this through some of your work, either the poetic spoken word or indeed extracts from your text, Pierre. So, you know, really an open conversation uh, between the three of us and, and the audience today. But I'd like to start with some slam poetry. So your paths, Afra and Pierre, intertwine today's you are spoken word artists from different parts of the globe. And I'd like our audience to understand some of the history and the nuances of the spoken word or slam poetry. So Pierre, can I come to you first? Can you paint a picture for our audience on the German slam poetry scene, please? And, and how did this start? How has it involved, evolved? And what's been your role as part of that, Pierre? Yeah, sure. Um, well, slam poetry is not a quite new phenomenon. It, it was founded in 1986 um, by Mark Kelly Smith in Chicago. 
and he found he, he was looking for you know to make literature enjoyable for the audience because he was kind of sick of all the authors going to their readings you know sitting on a desk with a glass of water open up their book and then read for 90 minutes and by the end everybody was asleep and then uh, he wanted to change that he was like literature it can be entertaining it can be fun so he uh, founded the first poetry slam in chicago it became first a phenomenon in the us and then it came over to europe and germany was one of the first countries in the 90s where uh, slams took place and um, it was a subculture of course in the 90s but then developed from that and when i started in 2005 it was a very professional scene already it was um, you were able to earn money from it by doing workshops, by, uh, by being booked and performing, and you could basically perform every night on, on, um, in any city you'd like. So that's why in Germany the slam scene is also called Slamily, because it's like a big circus family that is you know, traveling and performing. And today, I mean, it's, it's basically, it has reached the status of um, mainstream if you want uh, it really fills up big theaters it fills up halls where um, when i was in the finals uh, of the championship in 2012 it were 3000 people it was a live audience of 3000 people so um, and it was streamed also uh, via internet to the, uh, to the people who couldn't join so it's really huge and um, so i think whoever starts today has very good chances of making a living of it, you know, leaving the pandemic aside, let's talk, you know, March 2020, maybe. Uh, so, um, and, but I think it will be, it will be coming back uh, after the pandemic. Uh, the, the audience is longing for cultural events and for readings and, and poetry slam will always be a part of German um, literature, literature, yes. Excellent, thank you. It's so interesting to, to hear that from you, Pierre. And Afra, what about yourself? Tell me a little about, about the scene here to, to, to paint the picture for our, the, the rest of the audience around the world. How is it different or similar to, say, Germany or the rest of the world, the sort of spoken word or the slam poet genre here in the UAE? Um, so I... Uh you know, consider myself blessed to be from a culture that has had poets for centuries and centuries and centuries. And I feel like I'm part of a, a, a proud legacy of, of poets. So the, the idea of, of gathering poets and poetry recitals and even competitive poetry um, is not something that's new to, uh, to, to the region. It's something that's very much embedded in, in the culture. And I think you you grow up with, with a love and appreciation for, for poetry in all of its forms, whether it's written or, uh, or recited or you know, um, performed in a more, more theatrical kind of way. Um, and the, the poetry scene, or the, the more contemporary poetry scene, I would say, is, is growing um, every day. We just had a, a poetry slam in, in Sharjah, and there, um, there, there are so many uh, different organizations that are doing, um, that are hosting um, poetry evenings and poetry, uh, poetry recitals and uh, poetry competitions as well. Um, and I think it's quite, it's quite similar to, Germ uh, to Germany in the fact that it, it has grown into something that uh, gets people excited about hearing poetry. And, and I love, uh, just to give you an example, I love walking into, into schools and, and classrooms and, and I say, who likes poetry? And nobody puts up their hand. And then they, they experience uh, you know, poetry that would be typically um, thought of maybe as, as spoken word or, or, or something that would be a, a part of a slam. And, and they, they, you know, there's, there's like a light switch that changes. And it's, oh, oh this, this is amazing. We love this. So I, I think it's, it's grown into that, um, into that as well. And we're very fortunate here actually to have a thriving uh, cultural scene and a thriving, um, thriving poetry scene as well. No, absolutely, and we, we see that certainly in my time here in the UAE over the past 14 years, I've, I've certainly seen that, that grow. So Pierre, you, you've talked about the slam poetry. What creates the slam in slam poetry? Where does that bit happen and what does it look like? Um, I think it's the competition that makes it, you know, um, 
that makes it interesting for the audience. Uh, it's really because you and the audience, you get to decide the winner. Uh, you get to choose a winner. And so it's kind of, um, yeah, it's really you, you, you go there, you buy a ticket, you're excited, you're not only listening to poetry. In Germany, it's not only poetry that is being performed. I mean, we have a six minute time limit in Germany, which is much longer than most countries. And I think this time limit um, contributed to, you know, people performing short stories also, or comedy, you know, stand-up comedy. So it's a, a, a big variety of, of uh, performances and uh, poetry is just a small part of it. So um, it's really, you don't, you buy a ticket and you don't know what you're going to get, but you know that it's going to be a big variety and it's going to be exciting and that you get to choose the winner and I think that is what makes people um, you know, want to join and want to want to be there and it, it's really what um, what makes a difference compared to traditional poetry readings. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you, you, you say that and Afro sort of building on that, in what ways does slam poetry offer a different perspective to the audience and how would you say that that audience journey is is unique uh, I think like Pierre was saying that um, you know usually within a poetry slam uh, it's random members of the audience that are chosen as judges so they they hold all of the power and you're on stage and their their fate your fate is literally in their hands um, so it's that participation but it's also because of the time limit so um, normally, um, or in, in the slams that I've been part of, the time limit has been three minutes. Okay. And if you go over the three minutes, um, you start to lose points. And so your poem has to get to the point. It has to be concise. It has to be structured. Um, and it has to resonate with the, with the audience. Otherwise, you lose points. So it's, it's a lot of excitement in that. But you, you do know that you're going to be getting um, good poetry because you have to have, uh, you know, a... a a poem that, that the audience is going to like, that the judge is going to like. And I feel like um, with competitive poetry, there becomes, it becomes this kind of double-edged sword because as an artist and as a creative, you think, okay, do I write the poem that I want to write? Mm. Or do I write the poem that I know the audience is going to like? Mm. And sometimes they're one and the same, and sometimes they're not. Yeah. And so I've, I've had that artistic dilemma of thinking, okay, do I, do, am I writing for myself or am I writing to get points from, uh, from the audience? certainly something for you to resolve and that, that constant, constant battle, if you will. And Pierre, I've, you know, I've always felt, um, you know, emotionally, it's, it's, it, 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 it draws you in listening to, to, to slam poetry and slam poets almost evoke emotion. You've mentioned that before and the power of everyday language. Um, you know, slam poets deliver with enthusiasm, they deliver, you know, with their voice. Um, can you sort of lift the veil on how you create, curate a piece? Alfred sort of mentioned there the dilemma. But, but why does slam poetry provoke? I think it's uh, the best uh, poetry provokes, but, but um, we don't often, or we don't always experience, you know, the, the the highest quality on, on stage, which is uh, has several reasons. Uh, I think, especially in Germany, you know, it's an open stage, so anyone can perform. So you you are seeing professionals who have been doing it for years, who contribute for very high quality, and you see beginners who obviously they cannot be as good as as a professional yet, but uh, it opens up a space for development. So um, and um, I mean. It's really what Afra said. When you write for stage, you, you you have to ask yourself, who am I writing for, and what kind of um, a person I, do I want to be on stage? Because it's very different if you write for a, an audience that is seeing and listening, and if you write for an audience that is only reading your, for example, your book. And if you say I in a book, it can be your narrator, it can be your protagonist in the book, and nobody really will say, okay, this is the author's story um, but if you say I on stage it's kind of uh, um, you know the uh, the borders they vanish uh, from from uh, from the lyrical eye to the to you on stage and so I think it's a big big chance because you can say I and really mean I and you can 
you have to ask yourself, what, what do I want to transport? What, I want, what message do I want to deliver? And of course, it's very uh, lengthy to say, I just want to do stand-up comedy for six minutes and entertain people. Fine, of course. Uh, but you can also say, okay, I want to uh, provoke thoughts and I want to uh, uh, speak up. Uh, and that's a um, yeah, great variety and a great chance, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Um, I've often seen poetry, I don't know if either of you agree with this, as ideas without frontiers. Um, and maybe writing is a little bit like that, you know, ideas without frontiers. And I've, I've heard this being said about poetry, and particularly about spoken word, word poets, or as, it, as they seem to, to have the strength of heart, you know, almost to, to voices that, that, that can't be silenced. Um, Afra, is there anything that you won't be silenced on? And, and can you share a, an example of your work, maybe, where you have been on that cusp or the frontier of representing something that others are feeling, but you, through your power of words, can deliver? Uh, I think, you know, just it's, it's an occupational hazard, almost, of, of being, a, being a performer and being a poet, being an artist. And you have to, um, just to go back for a second to what Pierre was saying, if you want to win at competitive poetry, you have to bring your best and you have to always you know, give 110%. Um, but you also have to be willing to show your vulnerability to the world. And um, you know, I wrote a, an Elf Chen poem, which is a, a, a very short poem uh, that it says, uh, poetry is showing your neck to the ones wielding the sword. Um, and that's exactly what it is. I think sometimes you get on stage and you're sharing your story, um, which might be a story that, that other people have, have experienced or gone through, but you're standing there saying, look at me, this is, this is my story, this is my, uh, this is my pain, this is my triumph, and uh, putting it out there uh, to the world. And it, it takes a, a huge amount of, uh, of bravery and courage to get used to. I, I wrote a poem um, called Shira, and uh, it was a poem that celebrates the underdogs. And I remember when I was writing it, I, I went to my, my friends who are, um, who are creatives and I said, tell me about your rejections. I want to write this poem to celebrate all the moments where there, there's rejection and where there's self-doubt. And um, it's something that all, all, almost all you know, creatives go through, but I, I had put it into, into that poem and I wanted it to be a celebration of those, um, of those moments. And it wasn't until I got on stage to do that poem for the first time, that I felt the, the weight of that, that I felt the, 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 the weight of, of all of these things that you go through as a, as a creative. But it was amazing to, uh, to voice that and to be able to, to say, this is me, this is us, yeah. and, and this is what we go through. And, and, I, and I love that poem so much for that reason. And it's so interesting, Afra, to hear you say, this is us you know, that constant drawing in of the audience and that sense of responsibility that you feel when you're there on, on stage. And Pierre, you mentioned earlier on that, you know, through the poetry, you get an immediate response from the audience and that's part of slam poetry. And I feel that, you know, spoken word almost democratizes poetry. It humanizes it, uh, you know, especially with that live audience. And it, it allows the audience to also own it, going back to that point, Afra, it's, it's about us, you know, that great responsibility. Pierre, how do you navigate that, that sense of responsibility when, when you're drawing the audience in with you? I mean, it's also something you can play with, obviously, right? You can, it's always, it's, it's uh, something you can use. Um, there are some texts that, that uh, include the audience, you know, to, to say some lines, uh, and, uh, for example, so it, it really what it's really what you said that the democratization that works, but it works in two ways. It, it includes the audience uh, and give them gives them power, but it also um, um, makes it possible for anyone to be a poet for six minutes, you know, um, or at least try to. Um, and I think it's very nice. And um, for me, it was always when I teach the slam poetry in schools. I think I always try to say that you know it's it's. As long as you are authentic, you will be um, 
yeah, touching someone, and that's uh, the the most important thing. So don't. I think the audience has a very, um, yeah, sensitive, sensible, sensitive sense of, of you know if you are authentic or if you if you are pretending, you know, on stage, if you are trying to be someone else, and uh, and I think uh, the most important thing on stage is be, being yourself, being authentic, and then uh, whatever you're talking about, people will be touched in some way because. They, they realize that you opening up on stage uh, to a crowd and that's um, that's some, something they, they respect and um, yeah I think uh, that's that's what I, I, I would be interested in what Afra, Afra says to this but I think um, you know, being authentic is, is the key. That's a, a really powerful message Pierre and you know certainly something that that Afra, no doubt you agree with about that sense of authenticity and being true to oneself and, and the audience and drawing them in. You know, really interesting uh, to, to, for you to mention that, Pierre. Thank you. And I want to move on now a little bit to, to sort of unpick something that you, you've both uh, suggested before or mentioned before, and that's the, the vehicle of poetry to tell the story. You know, the power of words for storytelling, we see that in poetry. Uh, uh, Pierre, you've gone on to be transition uh, from a slam poet to an author. And I say transition because maybe, you know, you're, you're doing both. You're uh, potentially doing both. I know you've written, uh, 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 published a, a couple of books to now. How, what, what's the power of, of storytelling and, and how do you, bring that through your poetry, Pierre? I think, um, you know, I'm writing about, as a German writer, in, I write in German and I write for, um, well, in the first case, uh, a German audience. Of course, the books are being translated in, in many countries, so it, uh, you could say it's an international audience, but um, I mean, when I write in German, so, uh, and I write about Lebanon, and I think um, this is the power of, of books, of stories uh, in general, that you can, um, you know, I always say the news, you know, I could tell you what's happening in the news in Lebanon, for example, economic crisis, the explosion, so many people have lost their homes, so many people uh, are um, affected by the pandemic and so on. But we are all very uh, immune. <laughs> To, um, to numbers, uh, and they don't touch us really. And I think if I tell you the same thing as a story of someone, you know, it has the power to touch you. And I think so that the news, they go to the head and, and stories go to the heart. And that's the power of storytelling that you can really open up a new world to, in my case, a European audience, let's, let's phrase it like this, you know, uh, that's, that's very unfamiliar with Lebanon and with um, the things happening in the Middle East. So um, by telling a story, to them, they realize that there is a whole world they haven't been aware of. Thanks, Pierre. And, and certainly you've seen sort of through both of your works, Afra and Pierre, the, the use of language, you know, the use of language in, in changing perceptions when, when telling the story. And Afra, through your poetry, you use language through Arabic, through French and English. How does language help to shape the story and the delivery of that story? I think language is, is hugely important because, uh, so I wrote a poem um, about my late grandfather called Bint al and I wrote the poem um, in English. And it, when I finished the poem, I knew that that wasn't that wasn't it. I knew that that wasn't the, the poem that I wanted it to be and it didn't do justice to what I was trying to say. And so I tried to write the poem in Arabic and it still wasn't where it needed to be. And then a friend of mine suggested that I, that I write it in English and Arabic. And, and I think a lot of the times we think about language in, in like these, these separate boxes. And so in my mind, you know, Arabic poetry was on one side and English poetry was on another. And I, there was just this awkward space in the middle. Um, but I wrote the poem anyways, and I wrote it in English and Arabic, and that turned out to be the poem that I wanted it to be. And, and it, was, it was through that use of language as well. And I think that often things, um, especially when you're talking about things that are, that are cultural or things that have to do with, with identity and, and um, 
and you know diff just different um, different perspectives, language is an incredibly helpful tool. So um, writing about something in, in English um, with another language, I think, will help um, not only reach a broader audience, but I, I think it will will enhance the the work itself because uh, sometimes your creative language is one language, but the work begs to be done in a in a, in a different language. So it, it really um, you really have to think about it in terms of what perspective do I want this work to have. Yeah, yeah it's really interesting. It's like dreams. Now, what, what language do you sort of dream in? Is it, is it, yeah. is it your, your mother tongue if, or, or, or a second language? It's, it, it's fascinating. And I know your poem, uh, Chez Moi, brings in the, the French in, in, in that certain... Was, it was the first time I, I, uh, I actually learned French for that poem. Right. Um, because it was a poem that was uh, commissioned by the Louvre Abu Dhabi, and I knew that I wanted to be able to introduce the work in French. So I, I learned French for that, for that poem, but it lent itself to what I was trying to say in that, in that poem and bringing all these different perspectives together. Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. I really do find language fascinating. And, and, and talking about storytelling and perspectives, Pierre, you're, you transitioned from a, a poet to then become an author and your first publication, The Storyteller, was translated and that was its English title. Talk us through, um, why it was translated as the storyteller uh, and not the, the sort of straightforward German translation. And I understand, is it true that there are various other titles as well translated in other countries? Yeah, that's true. It's very interesting. I mean, these are obviously marketing decisions. Um, I mean, in Germany, uh, the book is called Am Ende bleiben die Zedern, which would translate as in the end, the cedars remain. You know, the cedar tree is a reference to Lebanon. And um, in English, it's the storyteller. And in the Netherlands, for example, it's the son of the storyteller. So the focus shifts uh, to, to the son instead of the father, uh, who is the storyteller. Um, um, yeah, so it's very interesting to see how in different markets, because this is what these countries, publishing houses, countries are markets. Uh, uh, how different markets, you know, titles are being adapted for, for titles. But I'm happy with all of those titles because uh, I think they all work. Uh, you can you could call the book The Storyteller and, and it's perfectly suitable, uh, uh, but uh, so is the son of the storyteller. So, um, yeah, it's really, it's really interesting. And, and Pierre, with the different titles, do you think that they still convey the same theme and the same message? even in different jurisdictions, they have different titles. Do you think that translation can be problematic? Mm, I wouldn't call it problematic. I mean, of course, with, every, with any translation, you lose something, but, of, but at the same time, you gain something. Uh, uh, I always admire the work of translators. It's really uh, uh, such a hard job to, not only because you don't only have to translate, you know, the content, but you have to prevail, preserve the, um, the poetry in the language, the rhythm of the language, um, which is very hard to do. And uh, I love the English translation because, of course, not everything is um, um, exactly the same because it can't be, but it's very original uh, 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 in those parts where it cannot be uh, the same as the German. It, it makes great um, uh, alternatives. And um, so, uh, it's, it's, it's really um, an incredibly interesting job to, to, uh, to translate a novel, I think, and uh, I, am, I have great re respect for, for all those translators. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm with the English translation, it's one of the few I really can read and understand, uh, with the others I can't. Um, but um, I'm very happy with, with, with how the book turned out, and I think it's exactly what I, if I had, if I had written it in English, this is what I probably would have written it, so it's, it's really nice. I mean, certainly having read it in English, uh, it, it certainly conveys a very strong message, the, the storyteller. And of course, the, the session today is being translated by some fantastic Arabic translators as well. So unpicking that idea of storytelling a little bit more. Pierre, you, you know, mentioned earlier on in your introduction that you started writing at the age of 13. That's when your writing started to evolve. And during, um, during the past couple of decades, I've worked with lots of young people from the ages of two this high uh, through to the ages of 18. 
and though those years are, are very influential. What do you think is important for children uh, and young people to focus on as they start to tell stories? What is it that they need to do during those years, as you did when you were at the age of 13, to develop, to tell their story? I think it starts earlier with the parents. Uh, I think it starts with, uh, you know, being told stories as a child and being read to, you know. Uh, so being in, being in a, growing up in a house where books are, uh, are available and stories are available and, and you know, um, being encouraged also to, um, to interact with those books and to end stories. So I think this is where it starts. But if you, I always say, if I teach uh, creative writing, for example, I always say, of course, I can teach you things, but you will learn the most about writing by reading. So uh, uh, read whatever you can read. Uh, uh, go to book fairs, uh, 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 get as many books as you can, and uh, or libraries, and, and and just read. But uh, you have to be a kind of a different reader. You, you not only have to be the emotional reader who loves to you know dive into the story. You also have to be an analytical analytical reader who always has to ask himself how is this done? You know, on a on a the level of craft, uh, how is this crafted? And um, if you do that, I think that there's a very good chance to, to, to understand that although um, it seems like a very high uh, or complex thing to tell a story, to write a novel, it's basically come, all comes down to craft, it's crafted, uh, uh, and there are techniques that you can use and there, that are being used. And, and, um, I think uh, reading is the, the most important thing uh, that you can do if you want to be a writer. I, I totally agree and I think we should continue to be read to, even as adults, you know, certainly read to my children who are 18 and 21 and I think it really does help to internalise patterns and internalise stories as well. And Afro, what about yourself? What were your sort of early experiences of storytelling? And I know you mentioned that Poetry is a big part of the Arabic culture, certainly in the wider region not, region, not just the UAE. What role does storytelling play as, as part of that? I mean, storytelling is, I, I would say that storytelling is, is central to our culture and it's really um, been, we've been generations and generations of storytellers and, and poets and so it's very much embedded in who we are. Um, my earliest memory actually is being I think maybe I'm two, and I'm sitting on the floor in our, in our old house in the living room, and in front of me is this, um, you're gonna find out how old I am from this, but um, a giant Webster's Dictionary, the blue one. It was this, like, you know, it was huge. And, and I remember sitting on the floor in, in, um, in the living room and, and just flipping through it and thinking to myself, look at, look at all of these words, and, and what do they all mean, and what can I do with them? And, I, and I, I'd like to think that that was foreshadowing to <laughs> uh, the fact that I was going to grow up to be a poet. But, but from that age, I think, you know, words and stories and, and poetry have always been a part of, uh, of, of my upbringing. They've always been a part of my life, and there are stories to this day. You know, my mother um, read... Uh, stories to us when we were younger and and to this day I there are stories that I read in her voice and so it, it's been um, it's been central and it's been a love that's really been in um, embedded in um, in me th throughout my life and and words were always there and, and books were always there I mean even when um, things were difficult or when there wasn't anyone else there was there was always books there was there were always words and there was always something um, something to be learned and I think because um, you know I started um, walking and talking at a really young age and so I was always getting into all of the books and all of the things like that so I think it's um, that's where it starts and, and Pierre made a, a really good point about um, it does start with parents um, and your environment and I think the, the amazing thing about spoken word um, in particular is that it's accessible it's not something that's that's far off that you have to have special equipment or a specialized you know degree or it's something that's that's accessible to everybody and I think that um, even the the book fair that we're at now is a, is a big testament to how central and how important um, reading and, and literature and, and words are to uh, to our culture absolutely and we're you know blessed to be able to do that in the middle of a pandemic as well with 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 still being safe um, in the in the current environment 
that, that we're in. Pierre, I want to go a little bit deeper into this idea of power of words and, and, and storytelling. And, you know, you transitioned from a poet to, to a writer. How do stories evolve? I mean, do you right from the beginning know where the journey is going to end? Or is it a case of, let me take it step by step, and I know it's different for different authors, but what was your experience during the writing of that, that first book? Um, my experience changed very much from writing the first book and writing the second book. Uh, and um, when I started writing the first book, I came from being a stage poet and um, I found it very liberating to now be able you know, to not be interrupted after six minutes, six minutes and, uh, and, and to be able to, to really invent, you know, uh, uh, protagonists that have a, have a whole life uh, uh, that, uh, to be told and, and I really uh, I loved it and it has 450 pages and I wrote that book in eight months um, and when I started writing the, the second book I, I, I only had this experience and I, I was like okay writing a novel takes about eight months <laughs> so I started writing and um, I realized it, it was much much different. I, it took me four years to finish the book because I had to, uh, and I think this is the more authentic writing experience. I had to delete. I had to start anew. I had to try. I had to you know, trial and error to, to realize. Okay, all I wrote up until now it it doesn't really work in the sense of you know structure making a story work and. So, so my, my whole approach to writing changed. And the first book, I wrote it really, I had a plan, I had a structure, and I realized that plan I made before, before writing. I started with the first sentence, I knew the ending, so I knew where I wanted to get to. Uh, and with the second book, I had a theme, I had a topic. I, it was, uh, I wanted to write about it, but uh, finding the right story, the right structure for that theme was, um, very different, and uh, all in all, I deleted 350 pages by writing the book. So almost, I, I deleted almost a novel <laughs> to write a novel. So um, it was very different. Uh, but I, I think it's uh, it helped me a lot because uh, when I'm now going to write my third book, um, I know that you know it's, it, it's it's an essential part of writing is failing. You know, in the sense of uh, writing, realizing this is not like Afra said with her poem. You know, she tried and she realized this is not the poem I wanted to write. And I think this is essential. It's not. I mean, failing maybe isn't the right word because you don't fail, but you you. It's just a, a one step of of several steps that are to go, and and uh, realizing that this is not what you wanted or this is not what what would work is one part of it. It's not failing, but it's it's, it's just an essential part of. Of writing and I think if you can accept that all pressure will go you know because you suddenly you don't have anything to lose you because you can allow yourself to write badly and to write uh, uh, it's okay because you know I don't have to use it I too can just delete it and start again and uh, it's very it's a big relief to know that now that's amazing uh, Pierre and, and it's, you know to, to hear that differences of between the two books and I am sure that for our audience uh, or those that, that are thinking about writing, uh, certainly that experience will, will resonate with them. And what I found when reading The Storyteller was that I learned so much about the history of Lebanon that I did not know. So whilst I was reading an, a, a story, uh, a fiction book, I was learning so much more about the reality of, of what was happening in Lebanon. Tell me about the research that you had to do or or did you already have that historical structure uh, in place? Um, you know, doing all the research, uh, uh, it really helped me get a better picture of Lebanon. It's a country that I romanticized for a long time because it was, you know, the country of my parents. I think this is a very typical uh, point of view for many um, young people that are second generation of immigrants. So, um, who never have grown up in the country of their parents. They just know it from visits, you know, uh, vacation, if you want, and stories again. And uh, these stories are mostly, you know, more positive than, than negative uh, because they are memories from the parents and they are um, 
they romanticize and what you what you do is you start romanticizing it as well because you go there in the summer for six weeks all you see is great food uh, the sun the ocean and then you go back and this is lebanon or whatever country um, uh, for you and, and this is how you grew up and then you suddenly you realize you're doing all the research and you realize 15 years of civil war that have not been um, you know still not being talked about uh, and, and the political class that is one of the most corrupt uh, in the world and all, all things uh, uh, that uh, that that um, you know, lead to your shifting your point of view and this is was very cathartic i think uh, uh, doing all the research and it also helped me to structure the book because if you have you know um numbers years like okay i go from 1975 to 2015 for example and these are historical events that happened that i can use it as a scene or as a um you know it happens in the background of my story it really helps you structuring your book uh, 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 more easily yeah no it's uh, fascinating to read and after coming to you that whole idea of a story evolving or a message evolving or the power of words evolving when you're writing uh, a poem or when you have a message to give how do those ideas evolve for you as a poet uh, as you're structuring your piece and I don't want you to break it down too much because it'll take the magic away for me <laughs> but but how do you structure and evolve that story uh, I have learned that I have no control over where the poem goes <laughs> Um, because often you start at one point and you end up somewhere completely different and somewhere uh, completely uh, different than where you thought you were going. And so you, I've learned to live with that flexibility, which is um, strange considering my personality. But, uh, but also, I, I usually have an idea or I'll have a, a line that I want to use or, or a couple of words that I think would, would go really well together. Um, or that, that sound good together, and, I, and I'll think about, okay, how, where can I take this and what do I need to say? And for me, I feel an incredible sense of responsibility because I think every poem I write, every time I'm on stage, it's a responsibility to myself, to my community, um, and, and it's just, I, I need to make sure that the message is there, and there's always a message. So um, I like to kind of have that mapped out in the beginning, but sometimes it takes a completely different turn. And I think often the best poems are the ones that take an unexpected turn. It's like a plot twist within the poem itself. It's interesting you mentioned that, that you allow that to happen. You allow the flexibility and the movement to happen. It was difficult. <laughs> and you said that that's different considering the person that I am. How do you, how do you come almost want to say come to terms with that but how do you accept that freedom that's almost uh, forced upon you as you're as you're creatively thinking I think uh, for me it's it, it's it's a lesson in progress it still kind of is because you think this is the poem this is what I want it to say and poems this is going to sound um, really strange but but poems sometimes take on a life of their own completely separate to what you think that they're going to do. And I think that's also the beauty of it, and it's understanding that sometimes the poem you want to write is not the poem that you need to write. Mm -hmm. And it's not the poem that needs um, to be written in that moment. And so I've learned to work um, within that. And, and if the poem takes a turn, uh, that doesn't mean that we can't use the, the first idea you know, um, later or, or in something else or turn it into a, a novel or a play or a, you know, a, a musical perhaps you know so uh, nothing really goes to waste but it's been a work um, a work in progress and it's really um, understanding that poetry can go can go so many different ways and I feel like that's also maybe a result of teaching because often you're taught that like to think about written word uh, work in terms of the way that stories are laid out so there's a, a beginning a middle and an end and sometimes with poetry the, the middle will become the beginning and the beginning becomes the end and there's all these different ways that you can work with it. I've, I've noticed that, that children are quite good at yep. kind of uh, just working with that flexibility um, through the workshops that I've done. Yep. Um, and I think it's, it's just learned, learned and unlearned behavior later. Totally agree with you. I love the idea of wanting and needing and, and that sort of you know, conflict there between that. But totally agree with you that I think some of the creative, the most creative are our children.
and sometimes we kill the creativity out of them as they, they, they progress in their, their education and that's what we really need to, to, to get back. Um, i to change slightly the, the, the conversation now and, and it's linked to storytelling but it really resonates with both of your genres about fiction and poetry that Sharon, you've mentioned it before uh, around identity, you mentioned identity before Afra and how has identity woven a, a golden thread through the work that, that you've done, um, you know, the, the, the poetry side of things and how do you express who you are through your work, Afra? Um, you know, I think um, in the beginning, I was writing about all of these huge, huge, huge topics and all of the things that I wanted to change in the world. And, and you know, that was great and it served its purpose. But um, I got to a point where I was looking at my work and I was thinking, okay, but where are you? Where is Afra in all of this? And so it's about, like Pierre was saying, it's about being authentic and being true to yourself and expressing that through your work, through the, the word choices that you make, through the language that you choose to use and, and, and being um, authentic in who you are. And that is the work um, that, and the poems that really resonate with, um, with people because you're showing them a true part of yourself, saying, you know, this is who I am, this is my story here you know um, this is this is it and I think that it's it's really about understanding who you are and that comes with time and it comes with, um, with with practice and it's something you really have to work on to be able to be comfortable sharing who you are with um, with an audience and I think it's um, it's quite daunting yes. to you know especially like throughout the workshops and things that I've done it's that I find that people will write the poems and then you ask them to share the poems and then it becomes, well, no, I, I, you know, I, I don't know, I, what this and that. And, and the amazing thing is, is that once you cross that barrier, magical things happen. It's, I, I can't even tell you how incredible it is to, to see that, that going past that fence and sharing your work and being who you are and, and, and just, you know, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting so enthusiastic talking about it because it's, um, it's, it's incredible. And it, it's something that, that comes with practice, but once you're there, it's, it's amazing. Honestly, I can hold my hands up to you, Pierre and, and Afro. You are one of the, you know, brave. Writers are very brave to really put themselves out there because you're absolutely right, Afro. It's, it's your story. You know, it's your message. You're, you're almost laying your, yourself bare. And, and, and Pierre, you talk a lot about cultural differences. You know, in your introduction, I mentioned your, your roots, uh, this whole sense of, of, of belonging. How, how do you navigate getting the best of, of both worlds? You, you talk about it and it's part of the theme of your story. Um, what are the barriers um, when it comes to cultural differences? But also, what are the opportunities, Pierre? Um, I mean, I had a German mother and a, a, a Lebanese mother, so obviously I got the best from, from both worlds, I think. Um, so. It, I think the experiences of, um, of growing up like this uh, differ very much uh, in Germany or in anywhere probably uh, from someone who has, for example, Lebanese only parents and whose whole appearance, you know, is more um, Lebanese than, than mine. So um, growing up uh, like someone uh, like that in Germany probably is, is very different. You make a different experience. You know, you you are more uh, more often probably um, the stranger to people. You know, uh, you are. You know, uh, and I, I, oh, I luckily I never had this uh, had to make this experience. And um, and when writing, it was. Uh, it's important to me to not, uh, to not, as I mentioned, to romanticize, uh, you know, the Lebanese culture or the Lebanese story, but at the same time show that there is a lot of tragedy, you know, to that, and that there is a lot of beauty also, that it, it's not only um, one side of the medal that is all just being talked about uh, uh, um, in the news, but that there are, it's more complex, to show that complexity, because um, 
culture is complex and, and, and uh, identity is even more complex. And, and uh, if identity is made of, of two or more cultures, it's probably the most complex uh, thing you can, you can write about. So, um, and then again, I think it comes to being authentic uh, and to, to try to captivate uh, the emotions that come with that in your writing and to transport that and just to make people who have no idea what it means to, in Germany we say, sit between two chairs, you know, to, uh, um, you're not, you're, there are many people who say in Germany, I'm always, you know, the stranger, but in my home country or the country of my parents, I go there, I'm the stranger too, so where do I belong? And, uh, I think um, and that's again the power of stories, uh, trying to make that experienceable to someone who has no idea of what it feels like. It, it's probably the, the strength and uh, what I aimed for um, uh, when I wrote the first book. Thank you, Pierre. So much of that resonates with you know my own experience as well, and certainly stories that that resonate with me personally. And you know, two of the most common questions that you know we get asked here in the UAE, 200 nationalities, you know, more than 200 nationalities here in the UAE. Common questions are, where are you from? And the second one is, where are you really from? You know, that idea of, of, of culture and identity. And we, we come towards the end of, of the session today. I want to turn to our audience to see if anyone has any questions for Afra or Pierre today. Hello. Yes, it's working. Um, thank you. I'd like to ask a question to Ms. Afra. Um, as I hear you, you say you're a poet. And uh, as in such society, uh, where not women, where women are, aren't mainly poets, do you, think, uh, do you think you're kind of uncomfortable? Or uh, did you have some doubts growing up uh, to become a poet? Um. I mean, I still have doubts, um, but about different things, and I think that's such an, an interesting question to ask. Um, I think in the UAE, we're blessed with a leadership that supports women in many, many different fields. Uh, so there has always been support. Um, I think that my doubts have been within myself. You know, am I good enough to, to do this? Are people going to like my poetry? Um, are people going to judge me for, for saying, you know, for telling my story? Um, and I think that's the amazing thing about poetry, that you can get past those, um, those fears. And I think it's, uh, it's, I love being on stage and I, and I love writing poetry. So I think it's just, uh, it's, it's been a, a really good experience for me personally. Another question, uh, apologies. Right. Yes, uh, so do you think, uh, apologies about the question, I don't mean any offense. Yet, uh, do you think um, writing books, poetry, literature in general is it outdated definitely not um, i know there's an idea that poetry is boring and books are boring but i mean look around so many people have have come here to celebrate books and i think it's um there's a there's a need for books especially now with the we just went through lockdown and, and we're going through a pandemic and people want to have something um something to read and something to uh, to keep them company and, and I think storytelling is always going to be important. Thank you so much for your question. Thank you That's so much. absolutely Thank brilliant. You. Thank you young man. Uh, very brave of you to ask the questions. Well done. Thank you. So Jalaluddin Rumi, regarded by some as one of the greatest poets and philosophers wrote, raise your words, not your voice. It is rain that grows flowers, not thunder. So Pierre, final thoughts, right at this very moment, Saturday the 29th of May, as we approach four o'clock in the UAE, I think it's two o'clock your time. What would be your words of power to our audience and for those that listen to this session afterwards? Well, I think by attending uh, this event or by attending the book, you, you already made uh, the right choice because you, you um, went into a cosmos of books uh, and, uh, and of stories and this is, um, uh, it shows that uh, you, know, you attra are attracted by, by them or interested in them and uh, I would encourage you to you know, let, let just float, float there and, and uh, 
and uh, enjoy the atmosphere, enjoy um, the stories you can experience there, and uh, to take home whatever you can can get. Uh, and, and as we said, read them to your children or read them by yourself, uh, uh, and maybe uh, try what you can, where they can take you, and what uh, you can experience from them. Thank you so much, Pierre. And you know, we really do hope to see you next year here on stage and who knows maybe we can organize uh, a reading and uh, a slam poetry competition and the same question afra to you um what would be your words of power to our audience or those that listen to this session later on um i think my words would be find your voice everybody has one it is the most powerful tool you have find your voice tell your stories, write the stories, and write the poems. Thank you so much, Afra. I once read that the two most powerful words are, I am. For what you put after them shapes your reality. So I invite you to hold on to those two words within you now, I am. And allow yourself to permission to create the reality that follows. Have a safe journey home, wherever you are, and we look forward to seeing you and Germany, our guest of honour, again next year, hopefully in person. Maslama.